German producer and songwriter Frank Farian is best known for his work during the disco era and contributing to the Euro pop and dance genre. He's also very notorious for exploiting black artists for their distinct images and screwing them over. This is how Frank Farian orchestrated two lip sync hoaxes. In the late 1960s, Frank started releasing solo music, but his music received little to no success. By 1971, he had begun working as a producer and was making records for Meatloaf and Stevie Wonder. In 1974, he recorded the dance track, Baby Do You Wanna Bump, and released it under the pseudonym Boney M, and the song became a hit in the Netherlands and Belgium. Frank had shied away from fame in the public eye, so he hired Maisie Williams, Marsha Barrett, Liz Mitchell, and Bobby Farrell to front the group. Bobby Farrell was born on the island of Aruba and later relocated to Germany to be a DJ and a dancer. Frank liked Bobby's style and dance moves, so he made him the main face of the group. Bobby never actually sang on any of their songs. All of the male vocals were recorded by Frank himself, and additional vocals were done by Maisie, Liz, and Marsha. Boney M was incredibly successful with eight hits and over 100 million records sold worldwide. They were mostly successful in England, France, and West Germany, and the success continued up until the early 1980s. In 1981, Bobby was fired from the group because of ongoing issues with Frank and unreliability, and was replaced by Reggie Sebo. After his departure, there were accusations about Frank cheating him and the other members out of money. Bobby reportedly asked to see the contracts, but Frank started acting weird. Soon, Bobby would be gone. The band allegedly had a share of only 9% of the royalties. He reportedly asked for 100,000 German marks, but he was told to sign some papers, and he ended up signing away everything, which included image rights, royalties, and his home. At the time, Bobby was staying in a 13-bedroom mansion in Germany with his wife and had to move in with his mother-in-law in the Netherlands and live on welfare. Boney M broke up a few years later in 1986. By 1988, Frank Farian had already found his new music act. Rob and Fab were dancers looking for work as background singers in Munich, Germany. Rob Pilatus was a model and breakdancer from Germany, while Fabrice Morvan was a rapper, dancer, and model from France. Those two formed a group and named themselves Milli Vanilli. The duo recorded an album and sold just a few thousand records. In late 1987, Frank found out about the duo and invited them to his studio to listen to a demo. Once at the studio, the guys liked the demo, and Frank promised to turn them into millionaires. On New Year's Day in 1988, he signed them with the obligation of 10 songs a year. But Frank wasn't impressed with their singing abilities, so he recruited mystery vocalists to perform the vocals. Their debut and breakout single, Girl You Know It's True, which was the demo, was recorded by those artists while Fab and Rob lip-synced during live performances. They were offered $4,000 each to be the face of Millie Vanilli when they were living in a Munich housing project. Frank paid off some of their bills and told them to either lip sync for him or give him back his money. They were poor, so they took the offer. The group was quickly gaining popularity and was touring the world by summer 1988. Every live performance was pre-recorded, but they were promised by Frank 
that they would get to sing their other songs and would be 100% involved in the album. Girl You Know It's True was a global hit reaching number one in Austria, Germany, and Spain, while it peaked at number two in America. Their debut album, All or Nothing, was written and produced by Frank, and neither one of the guys provided their own vocals for the entire record. The three singles, Baby Don't Forget My Number, Blame It On The Rain, and Girl I'm Gonna Miss You, all went number one in the United States, while their final single, All or Nothing, reached number four on the chart. The album spent 41 weeks in the top 10 on the Billboard Top 200, and it earned them three awards at the American Music Awards and a Grammy Award for Best New Artist in 1990. And the winner is... Millie Vanilli. Uh, we would like to thank Clive Davis. And Jim, and we want to say I'm from West Germany. And this is a symbol of freedom for East Germany and West Germany. And the best new artist is Millie Vanilli. <laughs> we want to say there are a lot of artists here in this room. There are a lot of artists outside in the world who can achieve the same award that we achieved today. And it's an award for all artists in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. The fame was getting to their heads, and they were behaving arrogantly in interviews, making comments about being bigger than the Beatles. But their success wouldn't last long. People started growing suspicious when they realized how thick their accents were when they spoke, compared to the accents in their music. Dialect accent specialists were hired by Arista Records in 1989 to accompany the duo and help them sound more like the singing voices. Back in 1989, they had a botched lip-syncing incident during a performance on the inaugural Club MTV tour. I wanted to die. It stopped. Girl, you know it's girl, you know it's girl. 80,000 people. Girl, you know it's girl, you know. You know, I couldn't repeat it 15 times. Girl, you, it got obvious. Still. So I stopped, I panicked, I ran off stage. Julie Brown, who used to work for MTV, ran after me. I didn't want to go back to stage. I had enough. 80,000 people waiting. I said, I have enough. I quit. But it didn't really raise eyebrows because it was very common for artists to lip sync in those days. Michael Jackson did it from time to time and all the other acts on a tour like Paula Abdul were lip syncing as well, so it really didn't matter to fans. In December 1989, Charles Shaw revealed that he was one of the three actual vocalists on the album and accused Millie Vanilli of being imposters. The other mystery vocalists were identified as John Davis and Brad Howell, while sisters Linda and Jody Rocco provided extra vocals. Frank threatened Charles for the revelation and banned him from the studio. Rob paid Charles $150,000 to retract his statement, but the damage had already been done. With the growing suspicion from the public, the duo demanded that they use their own voices and demanded a creative role on their second album. But instead, Frank fired the both of them, just like he did with Bobby Farrell, who was also forced to be a ghost singer. On November 12, 1990, the guys were forced to admit to being imposters and tried to convince the public that they actually could sing. You have to understand, we were seduced, we were abused, and we felt very guilty. 
That's but, the tune Milli Vanilli yeah, is singing yeah. now that the pop duo has been exposed so, so for gonna, never singing a note so on a Grammy Award winning album that sold more than seven million copies. We wanted to be stars. We want to get up on top. So suddenly this guy gave us a chance, so we took it. We were scared. People threatened us. We have evidence for that, and we're happy that it's over, you know? They presented we don't no evidence of those threats, but they did release this tape as evidence they can really sing. Unconvinced that wasn't more electronic enhancement, reporters asked for a live performance. Girl, you know it's true. Yeah. Ooh, 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 I love you. Yeah. I'm in love with you, girl, because you're on my mind. mind. And you're the one I think about most every time. I'm just in love, girl. And this is true. Girl, you know it's true. Frank Farion also admitted to the hoax. In an interview with the LA Times, Fab said, Every time we gave an interview, the reporters would hear my French accent or Rob's German accent, and they'd say, no way. How could these guys have sung those songs? Rob then added, and I quote, We didn't want to do any more interviews. The more we talked, the worse things got. We really love our fans. We just hope that they understand that we were young, and we just wanted to live the life the American way. A couple days later, the National Academy of Recording Arts and Science stripped Milli Vanilli of their Grammy and Arista Records dropped their album from their archives. Then the lawsuits started coming. Fans filed lawsuits against Milli Vanilli, Frank Farian, and their record label, Arista Records, charging them with fraud under racketeering and consumer protection laws. Another lawsuit was filed by singer-songwriter David Clayton Thomas for copyright infringement, alleging that the song All or Nothing used the melody from his 1968 song Spinning Wheel. Charles Shaw also sued Frank and was granted $155,000. Details about how everything was orchestrated eventually came to light. Robin Fab and the other vocal performers alleged that Frank took most of the money, just like he did with his group Boney M, and the vocal performers said Frank had them sneak into the studio after hours to record music to keep people from noticing the hoax. In an interview with Billboard, Charles Shaw said, I was already paid $12,000 for doing Girl You Know It's True. And he said, keep your mouth shut and you could do the whole album. I'm thinking, that studio worked for me. Yeah, Rob and Fab weren't in the studio. They didn't exist at the time. Everybody came in and they started working on the album. That's when he started putting the musicians in. He didn't need them for Girl You Know It's True because that was just one rapping voice and that was me. Frank didn't tell me the plan to find two good looking guys until after everything was recorded, after the songs hit the charts in England. Frank thought he could pull it off because he did it with Boney M for 25 years. He thought he was gonna pull it off, but he made a mistake and sent them to the States. When the shit got hot in Germany, he rushed them out and sent them to America. And I said it in a TV interview, I'll never forget it. I gave them two years and believe me, it's gonna hit the papers. Once they hit America, I knew it wasn't gonna last. When the track skipped on MTV, you wanna know what I thought about it? Every dog has his day. They didn't want anything to do with me. It was already being said they weren't singing. They just wanted to keep me away, but I kept fighting. Ken Levy, the former senior vice president of creative services at Arista Records said, we saw images of the two of them and we felt it was going to be great for us. We didn't ever imagine it would sell 8 million albums though. Jens Gad, the guitarist and co-writer of three songs on their debut album said, we never met Rob and Fab. There was no need for them to be in the studio. It was show business. Frank created the scenario where he put this and this and this together, and that was the show. It was completely normal. Toby, the engineer, said, when the group took off, Frank told me once that I shouldn't talk to anyone about that. The real singer, Brad Howell, was living near me in Frankfurt, so I had to pick him up in the evening after the secretaries left the studio and we would go in at night so no one could see. It was a secret. We worked in the evening and closed the windows. Jody Rocco, one of the female vocalists said, the boys couldn't go out in public and they had to hide their faces. We knew from the beginning that the wheels would come off. 
and I told Frank that. Robert, the former product manager of Arista Records, said, I caught on pretty early, probably at the video shoot for Blame It On The Rain. They had trouble remembering the lines, which made me think, maybe they hadn't recorded the song. What's going on here? It was something that was not talked about, to be honest. But definitely behind closed doors, it was talked about. I'm gonna link the Billboard interview in the description box if you guys want to read all the accounts from former employees and also people that worked on the album. Frank on the other hand apologized, but he was also very defensive. He said, It was a crazy idea. I thought, okay, it's just for the discos and the clubs. I never thought it would be a great hit. Not number one, not top ten in America. And then it was too late and I was too embarrassed to say anything. I've never heard such a bad singer. They wanted to sing. They wanted to write songs. It never happened. They went instead to discos till 4 a.m. and slept all day. All they ever really did was party. Someone who lives like that can't make good music. They don't have enough tone and quality in their voices. So my answer was no. No one wanted my music. It was better from America. A white singer singing black music wouldn't work. The record companies sent me back to German music. Boney M was the perfect mix of black and white music, but in America, music still had to be black or white. The real crossover didn't come until the late 70s, early 80s. The whole incident was repeatedly mocked on television shows like In Living Color. For the next several years, Rob and Fab tried to make sense of what happened and tried to bounce back from the public humiliation. They moved to LA and released their follow-up album with their own voices through Joss Entertainment in 1993. But it failed commercially, and the guys eventually fell out and stopped speaking to one another. Fab went on to serve as a DJ for KISS FM in Los Angeles and eventually launched his own solo music career. His debut album, Love Revolution, was released in 2003. Rob, on the other hand, never really recovered from the public humiliation and ended up spiraling out of control. He served three months in jail for assault, vandalism, and attempted robbery, then spent six months in rehab. On April 2nd, 1998, he was found dead in Frankfurt, Germany of an apparent overdose. As for Frank, he released a second album with the real vocal performers of Milli Vanilli titled The Moment of Truth by The Real Milli Vanilli. continued to work as a Euro pop producer and developed Euro dance groups like La Bouche and Lay Click. But he tarnished his own legacy by exploiting black folks for their visual image. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and like this video and subscribe to Black Femininity TV for more content.